and absolutely nobody in my entire life ever asked her to stop, with the one exception of the time that she tried to kill me. During the summer of 1953, when those events were still going on, I only lasted a few weeks at home. She grabbed for my throat like a mad dog, like a wild beast, with a look in her eyes that will never be erased from my memory. I staggered backward, carried by her weight and momentum. I lost my footing and fell to the floor, hitting my head on the ice chest as I went down. The choking pain of her fingers around my throat met the thudding ache of the blow to the back of my head. She banged my head on the floor, tightening her grip around my throat. Her face was only a few inches away from mine, and she was screaming words at me I couldn't even hear. Her mouth was twisted with rage, and her eyes, her eyes were the eyes of a killer animal, glistening with excitement. I gasped for air and felt myself sinking into unconsciousness as I tried desperately to fight back, to free myself. All I could think of was that my own mother was trying to kill me. If someone didn't help me, I was going to die. I tried with the last bit of my strength to struggle free of those choking fingers and managed to wedge one of my knees between her body and mine. I pushed upwards on her ribs with my hands, which loosened her grip. At least it allowed a trickle of air down my throat and kept me from losing consciousness. Now I fought back harder. I didn't want to die. I completely forgot she was my mother. She was trying to kill me, and if I had the strength, I would try to kill her first. She was terribly strong, and all I could do was concentrate on loosening her grip on my throat. The next thing I knew, the new secretary burst into the small room. My God, Joan, you're going to kill her! The secretary yelled. She tried to pull Mother away from me. Though she was also a strong woman, it took some time to separate us. Mother continued to hit me across the face. I felt her ring cut my lip and saw some blood on her hand. Joan, stop! Stop! You're going to kill her! The secretary yelled again. Finally, Mother allowed herself to be pulled away from me and started crying. I had one black eye and a cut on my upper lip which was swollen and covered with blood. My whole face was puffy, and I had a perfect handprint bruise across one cheek. A few days later, I was on my way back to the Chadwicks. Mother had told them that I was incorrigible and that she couldn't handle me any longer. I was a virtual prisoner now in their home. I wasn't allowed any phone calls or mail or visitors. I had to do extra work as further punishment and wasn't allowed to go anywhere except to church on Sunday. And she threw me down. She got on top of me and she choked me. And I saw a look in her eyes that I will never forget. It was like looking into the eyes of a wild animal. And I thought, I am going to die. Rewind!
one time, you know, she tried to kill me. I mean, I am positive that if there was not somebody in the house, she would have killed me. She knocked me over. She was choking me. I thought I was going to die. How old were you? Thirteen. It is such an extraordinary concept to have somebody try to kill you. I mean, I saw her eyes. I knew what had happened. And she had gone into some other realm. She was like a wild animal. And at that age, to think that the person that you're supposed to love and trust the most is the person that just tried to kill you, that is almost too much for anybody to handle at that young age. Hi, I'm Jeff Feldman. I'm a law professor at the University of Washington School of Law, where I teach courses in civil procedure, constitutional law, and trial practice. What is a deposition? Deposition is an opportunity for parties in a civil lawsuit to obtain testimony from a witness under oath prior to trial. It's part of the discovery process by which parties gather facts and information uh, so they can be better prepared at trial to present their claims and defenses. Can you tell us more about the deposition process? Usually depositions are held in the offices of one of the lawyers in the case. Um, after the witness is placed under oath, each party is given an opportunity to ask questions and obtain answers to about the issues that are raised in the case. Usually depositions last a maximum of seven hours, but most depositions actually last a good bit less than that. How are they recorded? A certified court reporter prepares and creates a transcript of the questions and the answers. What are some tips for someone who is being deposed? Well, the first tip, of course, is the most obvious one, which is tell the truth. You're going to be under oath, and as everybody knows, there are significant penalties that attach when you testify falsely when you're under oath. Having never given testimony at a deposition, I didn't know that the experience is second only to being tortured in the Spanish Inquisition or burned alive at the Salem witch hunts. In the dead of that winter, David and I had to return to New York for my deposition in the will contest and to meet with my editor regarding the third and last section of the manuscript. The deposition was one of the most grueling and nerve-wracking experiences I'd ever had. We started at 8.30 in the morning and finished about four in the afternoon with an hour for lunch. I dreaded going back for day two. I knew I was telling the truth, but that didn't help when the estate lawyer consistently accused me of lying about events. It was an experience shrouded in surrealism, the very incidents, the identical feelings that I had just written about in my book, were being replayed for me in real life, presented by the estate attorneys. It was extraordinarily weird. And even though I was reminded by my husband and attorneys that I was the childhood victim, it didn't assuage my not-so-deeply-buried childhood fear of being punished or annihilated. It was as though the ghost of my mother had managed to materialize and speak through the mouths of the opposition attorneys who were representing her estate. Their words, even the insulting, demeaning intonation they used, were of grisly similarity. Somebody in the house heard her screaming, and somehow she managed to pull her off of me. I believe I am quoted in Christina's book to have said something like, Stop, you'll kill her. There was a point when they were having an argument. What precipitated it was possibly one of many misunderstandings, or where Christina had lied to Joan and the hostility was getting greater. Joan came towards Christina and gave her a good swat and hit her at the neck area. There was no brutality that night. I can tell you that I never saw any discipline toward Christina or the other children that I would call out of control. I can't conceive of the distortion, unless Christina had a deep-seated plan, a vendetta, that was present even when she was 14. Christina lied often for absolutely no reason. On more than one occasion, I found Christina to be an opportunist, dishonest, and distorting everything, every single action of her mother. When I heard about the book and its contents, I was sickened about it because I knew what kind of mother Joan was. I remember we used to go to Chadwick's to see Christina in plays. There was no one more supportive in the world. I never once saw Joan drunk. 
I was there in the house working for Joan for a year and four months. I take such a terrible view of what she's done. The book was a pack of lies that made your hair stand on end. I have utter contempt for Christina. Billy Green, 1978. When Christopher and I came home for summer vacation in June of 1953, Christina recalls, things were downright miserable. I was home for less than two weeks before she sent me back to school again. A couple of weeks later my brother joined me there. Joan Crawford also remembers that summer well, it was a miserable time, she says. Christina teased her young brother unmercifully and they both began picking on the twins. All four children had strong personalities of their own, and I felt that the best solution was to send Christina back to school. Since 14-year-old Christina and 11-year-old Christopher were the only children at the school, they moved out of the dormitories and into the home of the couple who directed the institution. Commander Joseph Chadwick and his wife Margaret. The Crawford children had been told by their mother that she could no longer give them an allowance, so the Chadwicks proposed an alternative. They allowed me to work in their home, said Christina, helping Mrs. Chadwick with the cooking, cleaning, general housework, anything that had to be done. They paid me $30 a month, which I shared with Christopher. We kept the arrangement through that year and until I was taken out of school. Although Christina was not aware of it, her mother had planned this financial setup herself. I believe that it was excellent training for Christina to earn money by doing housework, says the actress. The money she received was really paid by me. I told the Chadwicks to give it to her. Red Book, October 1960 first things first if we could I'm surprised frankly to see you here there were reports that you had a, a stroke somewhere near the the opening of the movie mommy dearest and you look in fine health what's the story well I I believe in miracles I had a I had a stroke in August and I had a brain operation very serious one um, my my short hair <laughs> as a result and uh, the doctors gave uh, me a 1% chance of uh, recovery, but here I am. And you look about 100% as we speak. <laughs> there were suggestions at the time that your stroke was somehow related to the opening of the movie. Was that a coincidence, or could there have been a connection? No, there was, uh, there was absolutely no connection. It uh, had uh, built up over many, many years and um, uh, had nothing to do with the 
immediate present. You were too young to have a stroke. How is it possible? Nobody knows that. Um, I, uh, I had none of the uh, symptoms, high blood pressure, diabetes. Um, I had never taken birth control pills. Uh, they don't know why it happened. You and, were athletic uh, and yes, exercise. Yes, and um, smoke a little bit. I, I was a smoker. I'm not now, of course. Um, but uh, nobody knows why it happened to me. In August 1981, at the age of 42, I suffered a massive stroke. The damage caused was so severe there was little hope for me to live and less that I could recover. But although I saw death firsthand, the universe had not decided to end my journey, only to begin a new one. Finally, they could see the cause. There was an embolism, a blockage in the left carotid artery leading up to the base of the brain. The x-ray was crystal clear. The embolism was about three and a half inches long, located less than one-eighth of an inch away from the base of the brain, and extended downward the length of the artery. The neurologist was visibly horrified when he found the embolism on the x-ray. He looked at it and he said he didn't know what to do. As far as he was concerned, it was totally inoperable, but he was to consult with a vascular surgeon and a neurosurgeon. As I gradually began to really understand what had happened to me, a haunting realization surfaced. In the hospital, the doctors questioned me as thoroughly as they could about possible causes of my stroke. They were interested in what might have been a source of original damage to the left carotid artery in my neck, since I had no history of high blood pressure or high cholesterol. They asked me about a car accident or a neck injury. I had experienced none. The only incident I could think of was a violent argument my mother and I had when I was 13 years old. She had been drinking at the time and flew into a rage. I recalled this incident in the book Mommy Dearest, not knowing at the time I wrote about it that I would later have a stroke. Uh, nobody knows why it happened to me. Well, I had a stroke in uh, 1981, and uh, I almost died from it. Uh, what I now know is that long-term uh, psychological stress and anger, which I had a lot of, uh, can damage the vascular system and put us adult survivors of childhood mm -hmm. abuse uh, in high risk for heart attack and stroke. Uh, nobody knows why it happened to me. You had a stroke after you wrote your book. Yes, I did, 1981. Do you have any doubt that this was provoked by the kind of heat you took for what you talked about? I think about? it was probably the the end result of it, but it had been building for a long time. It was a complete blockage of the left carotid artery, and uh, so that had been damaged when I was a child, unfortunately. Yeah. Yes. Uh, I'm not sure I understand you to your answer. You're saying this may or may not have been related to the stress you felt you took after Mommy Dearest. It was partly that. I, I think see. that was the, the final uh, result of it, but it had been building since I was a kid. Um, yeah. My mother had tried to kill me, and she tried to choke me, and uh, it uh, damaged the artery in my neck, but it took many, many, many years, a lifetime of stress and chaos, to um, yeah. have it uh, yeah. break. 